waiting. <laughs> Welcome to the May Metrics meeting. I wish it was May the 4th, so I could say May the 4th be with you, but I'm going to say that anyway. <laughs> we are obviously interrupting our regularly scheduled programming for a special announcement. OK. So um, I sent the email pre-announcement out to you guys two hours ago. And so I'm assuming everybody has seen it and read it. And that's why we're all here sitting in the front row, sitting up straight, et cetera. <laughs> I'm going to walk you through. <laughs> I'm going to walk you through. Uh, what we're going to do this morning, but before I launch into a long thing, I want to give a moment for Lila to just wave <laughs> and so say hello. OK, so um, I was going to say I stand before you. I sit before you. I sit before you exultant, right? <laughs> this is a really, really good day. So what we're going to do um, over the next little bit is I'm going to talk for 90 seconds or five minutes, and you will indulge me as I kind of recap how we got to this moment, right? Then I'm going to throw to Lila, and she will do a little sort of introduction to herself, where she comes from, why she's here. I'm going to then throw back to Gail. Gail will facilitate a Q&A. And so if there are questions, I think James Forrester is on IRC, and Eric will be on IRC too. So they'll stick handle the bringing of questions in from remote people. And the folks in the room obviously will do it in the ordinary way. Um, and then we'll have lunch. No, then we'll have the normal metrics meeting. Yeah. And then we'll have lunch. <laughs> then we'll have lunch. OK, so I will now recap a little bit. So we have been searching for our next ED for not quite a year. Um, and a bunch of people in the room have joined us since we started the search. And so there might be folks in the room who actually don't remember, weren't here for the discussions about what we were setting out to recruit. So I'm going to recap them. And I did this a little bit in the pre-announcement this morning. So what we wanted to do, the core of what we were looking to recruit was someone with a strong product and engineering background. Right? That's consistent with our emerging understanding of ourselves as, yes, we are a website. right? And with our narrowing focus and with wanting to concentrate more and more on the product and engineering piece of our work. We do more than that, but that's kind of the core of what we do. I have the long list of attributes here. Uh, we also were hoping to find somebody who came from an open source background or some form of online community, always not very well defined, but something with a community component to it. We're looking for a person who had experience with growing organizations because that's really different from leading something that is stable or something that is in decline. We're looking for someone with experience managing um, staff about the size of ours and budgets about the size of ours. We had important requirements for soft skills, which like I said in my note this morning, we all know what that looks like for us. We're an unusual organization. We need people who have a high degree of integrity. They are very open. They are open to influence. People who are highly collaborative and have a strong orientation towards transparency. All of that, those are rare attributes. And they're particularly rare, honestly, in people in leadership positions. right? So we were looking for a particular kind of executive leadership style. We wanted somebody with experience in complex stakeholder environments. So we are a big, wild, woolly international movement where it is not a command and control environment, and there is not a lot of clarity around roles and responsibilities. And so we had to have a person who is both experienced with that and, and kind of has an aptitude for that. Some people do not, right? And we were looking, of course, for somebody. We have to turn off the fans. <laughs> We, thank you. And we were looking, of course, for somebody um, with an international orientation, ideally a person who had lived or worked outside of their country of origin, <laughs> like so many of us. And then I, I think I remember talking about this at a previous metrics meeting. We were also looking for a person, um, we realized as we went through the search process, who had courage, right? Somebody with a lot of personal integrity. Wikipedia, we wish that the idea of bringing free knowledge to everybody in the world wasn't a really radical idea, but we know that it is. And so we need to have somebody who can stand really strong against censorship and against attempts to intimidate the projects. And that is also a really rare attribute because, as Jeff told me a couple times during the process, most people actually have experience um, folding to censorship, right? Most internet companies just comply with whatever the local laws are. And we don't always do that. And so we need to um, have somebody who is courageous. So that is a unicorn. 
and we looked for a while and we did a whole first round and in about December the transition team faced a decision point where we had to decide whether we had done a full and complete search and that was how it was going to be and we were going to have to make some compromises on some of the attributes that we were looking for and we made what I thought was a pretty courageous and we were all a bit anxious at the time decision to um, in effect reboot the search and, and sort of start again, right? And when we did that, we did not know if it would work, and so we were anxious. Um, we were looking for a unicorn. We were not sure that a unicorn existed, um, and I am thrilled to tell you <laughs> that I think we found our unicorn. I really do. <laughs> And and you know, and you can imagine, and I know it's so embarrassing, right? We're just like, gosh, we will just gosh. It, it is a, no pressure at all. <laughs> She's a human being, but a unicorn. Um, and, and truly, right, like you can imagine through the whole process, what was I thinking and, and how was I feeling through the whole process? I was feeling very, very, very intensely the weight of what is right for this thing, what is right for the people in this room, what is right for our remote people, what is right for the mission. It is a big responsibility. We wanted to get it right. We were uncomfortable at various stages of the process. We were unsure, but we all feel really great now. I am not going to um, go through your CV and stuff because I want you to express yourself however you want. And there's a note and you're on LinkedIn and people have probably already massively Googled you and that's all good. Um, but let me turn it over to you now to talk about why you're here. Thank you. Do you have no, I don't think so. I think we're going to have to exchange it. Um, hello, everyone. It's it's really uh, really exciting to be here, and uh, thank you, Sue. No pressure. <laughs> um, and I want to obviously thank the board and thank the um, transition team uh, for doing an exceptional amount of work. In fact, this has been the most thorough <laughs> process <laughs> that I have ever experienced coming into an organization. Um, I think uh, all of the other processes put together don't really account amount for this. <laughs> so um, I've been really, really anticipating meeting all of you. Um, and this is really uh, exciting, uh, exciting day for me. I was literally counting seconds <laughs> up to this. Um, and uh, just in full disclosure, uh, if you've looked me up, I have actually been looking all of you <laughs> up <laughs> for the last month or so. So don't be surprised if I know um, some of you and I recognize you. Uh, do help me with your names, though. It's, uh, that's the hard part for me. I, I need to remember um, remember them. Uh, so uh, extremely, extremely excited to be here. And uh, with the, all of this thorough process, um, I want to give you a little bit of an idea why I ended up being here, sitting, having the privilege of sitting in front of all of you, um, out of what 1,500 people, something like that, something. Yeah, something really, <laughs> uh, really impressive, <laughs> I would say. So, um, as you probably already know, I was born in the Soviet Union, um, and uh, I was born in a family that uh, is quite interesting. My uncle um, uh, was a uh, writer, and he basically ran away uh, from the country when I was just a baby, a couple of years old. Um, and I was born in a family of artists and scientists, and I never could reconcile those two. And you'll see, I'll, I'll explain to you a little bit why. And I actually have given up. And I decided that those two are actually art and science are one and the same, and I'm going to treat them as such. Um, early in my life, I really uh, experienced what uh, information, the freedom of information, and especially information empowered by technology can do, can do to country and uh, can do to, can, can completely revolutionize what's happening. Um, my, um, when I was about six or seven, uh, my parents were coming um, back from Kiev, and uh, it was the day that Chernobyl blew up. And uh, my family was lucky enough to get out of uh, of Ukraine, and they were passing actually by uh, uh, through uh, through the area uh, in time. But a lot of my friends uh, have been touched by the tragedy at the end. And the worst thing that happened is that the information was not disclosed on time. A lot more lives and a lot of more people could have been saved. Uh, but until actually the technologists in Sweden detected the amount of radiation that was uh, that was hitting the scale, um, 
got, the government was not willing to uh, to step up and admit to what was going on. Um, th so two things came uh, came together there, and that's uh, shaped my early understanding of both technology and information, and important of of, of both of those. Um, one, that information always, naturally, like air, wants to be free. And it's our job to enable that to happen. And how do we enable that to happen? We enable that to happen through the technology that's constantly evolving and enabling for that um, to become so. And no matter how long uh, we try to contain it, it's like air or like water, eventually it will find its own level. It will, it will, it will escape and it will be there. And this is why this is so important to me. So. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of a forward, fast forward, when I was 16, um, I actually tried to experiment uh, with different uh, subject areas. And I, I started uh, attending university and, and uh, learning some science. I actually tried uh, writing some articles for local newspapers. And soon I realized that I wasn't going to, um, I wasn't uh, going to see a challenge that would challenge me enough uh, to step up to kind of the next and 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 really uh, step in and uh, make the difference that I wanted to make. So I decided I had the opportunity to go to New York, and I jumped at it. So I just boarded the plane, and I ended up finding myself in uh, Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, and I can't tell you enough. Uh, and I'm sure all of you here probably experienced something similar. I found myself like a two-year-old. I didn't know the language. Um, my life behind me, I was on top of my class. You know, I had, um, I was, you know, I was on a good trajectory. All of a sudden, I had to completely reboot. And uh, people say it's, you know, I was brave to, to do so. I didn't see it that way. Um, I see it as having stamina because it wasn't hard to, get to New York. What was hard was to survive the first year. Um, I had to work and support myself through my school and eventually when I ended up going to Berkeley to study computer science and art, um, I ended up doing supporting myself all the way through and through. And I was really, um, I feel extremely grateful for the opportunity to do so because we're all here are able to make this uh, this uh, technology successful, so that the rest of the people around us can really leverage it. So um, once I got here, um, I it, it it took a life. My life took a life of its own, uh, just because there's so much opportunity and so much uh, so many interesting things uh, to do here. And uh, um, I worked on a couple of open source projects. I um, I started my own company. I did a lot of consulting, but eventually I ended up at Sugar. And I, uh, just so like you, I ended up uh, coming into an organization. So my, my little org was three people. <laughs> and uh, I ended up, um, I came in as a DevOps person. Uh, I'm very, I, I come from a technical background, as most of you already know. Um, I grew into different roles. I took over products. Uh, I took over, um, I was given actually products. Uh, I was given um, uh, IT, full, full, uh, full IT organization, uh, customer support, then services. And then uh, when we were successful uh, doing all of the technical stuff, I got to brag about it and, and run marketing for a while. <laughs> So I ended up um, having great experience uh, building an organization from uh, a few dozen people uh, to 400, some if you count uh, if you count everybody who's involved with Sugar today, and that's been a fantastic experience and prepared me well for just the kind of operational aspect of uh, of running a large org. So that is why um, you know I ended up I think, <laughs> and uh, so I can tell you more. Um, being this kind of unicorn. And by the way, the unicorn uh, metaphor is not new to me. I, uh, that's, uh, that's what people used to joke and, and uh, say to me, um, even at Sugar as well. I actually had somebody attach a unicorn picture to my office. And yesterday, Gail gave me this inflatable uh, <laughs> unicorn. So somebody, I'm not really good at inflating things, so somebody's going to have to help me. 
<laughs> so, um, so help me with that. But uh, <laughs> um, you'll see me blush. But um, that's uh, that's uh, that's not new to me. And and uh, I expect you guys to make fun of me all the time because. Um, um, you know, a Russian comes out somehow every now and then uh, in in very interesting ways. So, <laughs> so um, I am extremely, extremely excited to be here. It, as I was telling you, I was counting seconds before. So um, I think I'm over two million seconds now uh, <laughs> to this moment. <laughs> um, I am. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, to meeting all of you, and I will make my make it my goal to make sure that I meet with every each and every single one of you in the next few months uh, one on one. But in the next few weeks, so I think Eric has been uh, has been great, and he started setting up uh, meetings already. So I think tomorrow. And uh, early next week, we're already starting to meet with the product team. And I think Mariana and Steven uh, and, and a few other people are in those meetings. I'm really, look, really looking forward to that. And I think uh, 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 Lisa is, uh, is looking to set something up with uh, Megan uh, and I <laughs> um, and, uh, and her team as well. So I am going to be in full-on learning mode, and Sue has been gracious to uh, continue to lead the organization from all of the operational perspective. Um, so until about June 1st, um, until June 1st, um, I am going to be here meeting with you, learning, understanding, and uh, and Sue will continue to uh, to lead, and then we're going to swap, and that's that's extremely extremely helpful. So. I'm here, I'm extremely excited, and I'm really, really ready to engage with you. Thank you for having me. Can, can I say, um, I'm going to throw it back to Gail in one second, um, but I just wanted to say I'm really proud of us. So, so for the past, I don't know, month, right, we've been carrying around this sort of secret and preparing and stuff, and I was the first person to accidentally break it. I don't know if a soft, you remember a meeting that we were in a month ago where I said, well, Lila will be late, and then I was like, uh. <laughs> and, and, and we have all done that. Even Jeff has done that, which is extraordinary. <laughs> um, and, and so I feel like it's been kind of a quasi open secret a little bit. Maybe people haven't necessarily known the name, but we kind of, it's been kind of out there a little bit. And I'm proud of everybody. So two things. One is I'm proud of everybody for kind of respecting an embargo that you kind of knew about and kind of didn't know about it. I really appreciate that seriously because I think it's, I'm a control freak and I think that it's important to roll things out in a thoughtful, intentional manner and so yay, we have done that. Um, and the other thing I want to say is we're probably still going to wander around the halls shushing ourselves and that's kind of weird, right? Yeah. But eventually we will all get used to the idea that this is like public and we can talk about it freely and openly and yay. Um, during the search process, part of the process was um, screening candidates, and so there was a paired process where a board member and senior staff would um, screen new candidates. So I partnered with Kat Walsh, and we were on the phone with Lila. And before we get off the phone with Lila, this is the end of the meeting, Kat's already IMing me saying, unless we find out she eats babies, we want her. <laughs> <laughs> So I imagine. No, I don't babies. <laughs> Full disclosure. No. We 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 did research that in the background check process, which was exhaustive. Um, I imagine that a few of you have questions out there. So, if you are a staff or community member, we are happy to take them. If there happens to be press, we will not be taking those because this is this is for us and our community right now. So we'll start with Victor back there, and then we'll alternate with questions as they pop up on RSC. And guys, can you introduce yourselves too, just because Lila will not know who you are necessarily. Yes. Hello. Okay. Yes. My name is Victor. Uh, can you please say your name for us, how you would like it to be said? So uh, my name in English is Lila Tretikov. Um, if you want to hear my name in Russian, it will be Lila Tretikova. <laughs> Thank you. Additional questions? James? Hi, I'm James. I'm, I'm not answering, asking my own question, though. The question is, will you be coming to Wikiconference USA, which will be in New York at the end of May, to meet people? <laughs> that was actually not in the plan. <laughs> I'm looking at, at Sue, like, what, which one, what? 
Uh, no, but I will be at the conference in Germania uh, in August, of course. And you'll be in Zurich. Oh. That is correct. I will also be at Zurich. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I will also be at Zur in Zurich um, at the end of next week. Other questions? Be bold. <laughs> <laughs> So, with one question down, here's my next question from the community. Sugar moved from open source to community edition and then to abandoning its open source version. What was your role in that and how do you feel about that transition? <laughs> so it's a nice, easy question there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so let me give you a little bit of a background. When I took over... <laughs> Um, so when I took over, one, one of the reasons I went to Sugar, uh, one of the major reasons I went to Sugar because it was open source. Um, I grew up uh, through Berkeley open source years, um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, when I took over engineering at Sugar, I actually brought the community much closer in, and we started taking active contributions to the code base. Um, so. Um, and culturally, I'm very much uh, um, in favor of having of doing open source technologies. Um, over the years, so Community Edition and uh, CE um, and Open Source Edition were all the same thing, actually. Um, so I just want to make sure to clarify that it's uh, there was no no real changes there. It was just the name. Um, but uh, the decision to not release Sugar 7 as an uh, open source edition um, was actually made by the um, executive board. Um, and uh, to tell you the truth, I'm really, I'm really proud that we have had open source edition for all of this time. I'm really happy about that. But um, in the end, uh, as you know, uh, the decision was announced after I left. Additional questions? Anyone in the room? Are we asking them on IRC? Is this the process now? <laughs> the, the advantage of asking them on IRC is that they get read out in this accent, and of course no one gets the blame for asking the horrible questions. <laughs> I think you should e name except them. me. You should, you should name I, the I like questions. Come on, guys. Ask me something. <laughs> I've got... Um, oh. Viva's got one. Um, Hi, I'm Vibha. I'm a designer on the design team. Uh, and I'm just curious what your um, interest in user experiences and if you will spend, if you will find some time to come meet us on the third floor. <laughs> oh my god, Bala, thank you for asking this question. So um, user experience is my passion. So when I talked about um, combining, t thinking of um, art and science as one, this is what I truly mean. I think whatever we do, we need to be thinking from the perspective of the people who use our work. Um, and over the years, so I did I did art and I did science, and my where where I'm what I'm really interested in that intersection uh, between what computers do really well and what humans love to do, right? And what that translates in is user experience. At Sugar, I actually build the user experience team from scratch, and the latest um, version of Sugar is all about user experience. So I, I brought it out as front and center of, uh, of uh, the uh, engineering and product uh, philosophy. Um, and, and when you think about it in, da in more depth, and when you start thinking about your constituencies, about, um, about our community, and about people who use uh, Wikipedia, and, and uh, um, our sister projects every day, we have to keep in mind, we have to understand and really empathize with our users. And this means understanding the differences, understanding that the, the person in Guam and the person in San Francisco have very different cultural backgrounds, use technology and relate to technology in a different way, and really need to be understood, uh, and the experiences need to be understood at a lot of depth. So I'm really looking forward to looking at that with the eye, with the lens of, of our end users. James Forrest, wait. Yeah. James Alexander, and then Brandon. 
So I'm also James, just to make it more confusing. Um, and to make it worse, we're actually roommates. Um, but uh, if you can pick one thing, or one of each, what is the things that you're looking the most forward to over the next like two or three months? And what is the thing that you are dreading having to deal with over the next two or three months? <laughs> Great question. You guys are uh, not, not holding any punches. I like this crowd. <laughs> okay, so um, I believe that at the heart of every organization are the people. Um, for us, it doesn't just mean, of course, uh, the employees of the foundation. It also means the community. So I'm really looking forward to meeting people, um, connecting with people individually, and figuring out uh, what people are passionate about, what what are your strengths, and uh, where do you want to go with your both uh, professionally and personally? What are your what are your goals? Because I think at, at its best, the organization will uh, bring out the best in you, right? Um, so that's uh, that's what I'm really truly looking forward to doing first. Uh, what am I dreading? Um, I don't think there's anything that I'm particularly uh, particularly dreading, uh, but things can get you know. Um, I'm dreading being misunderstood. I think that's probably the most uh, most the scariest thing for me, and uh, it will be really important for me how I communicate with people. And I will truly leverage. I will tr I will ask to lean on all of you to help me with that. Brandon. I would suggest that you should actually start dreading getting stuck in an elevator. <laughs> you know, I've been there for hours once. It's not pleasant. I'm just, I'm just. I, there's a reason I only take the stairs. So. Hey, just. Good for your uh, health. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's just be clear. I'm not a healthy guy. Um, so my question is actually, um, as you're aware, undoubtedly there is a tension between the goals of the foundation or the activities of the foundation and the goals or activities of the editor community. And as has been something that we fall into all the time in terms of like uh, a conflict has to do with who is actually in charge. And I like to think of it as a question of are we shepherds or are we babysitters? Um, and you know, if we're shepherds, then that means we're supposed to lead and we actually take a more firm hand and we say like we're going to be making sure we're not run running off the edge of cliffs. We're going to be going to these different pastures. We're going to be doing this sort of thing. But if we're babysitters, we're just basically making sure that you don't stick your fingers into the wall socket. Um, what is your position on that in terms of like, are we, should we be more aggressive in terms of maintaining leadership? I mean, can we just go, go to the community and say, yes, we are going to roll out the visual editor to everyone today, and you've got to eat your peas? Or um, are we going to be like more, are you, you, you're thinking that you're going to be, we're going to be more, soft about that kind of an attitude? That's a great question. And I think I'm going to have, my, have to take some more time than I already have uh, to understand what the best approach is. Um, obviously, I've, I've uh, already run into the questions around that. I've uh, looked at it uh, in some detail. But I don't think I know enough about it yet. And I'm going to work with all of you to understand this better uh, in the over the next few months. Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective how I think about these issues, I really like to use data uh, to guide me in those decisions, and I also like to give people choices right, as part of their user experience uh, so that you gently guide them towards the right, to, towards the final uh, objective. But I also understand that with a large, large community, uh, it's a change is, overnight change is not, not something that you can, uh, you can easily deliver. So I think we're, this is something that we're all going to have to look together at in the next few months, and I'm going to need to form um, some, some plan and opinion around it. There's a few questions on IRC. So James? Hi. Um, first one, since Lila has a more technical background than Sue, does she expect to be more involved in tech product decisions compared to Sue, or will she mostly focus on executive management? <laughs> I can't wait to um, to be involved, not necessarily in decision, but in uh, building and um, understanding and uh, working on uh, the product. So I think that's fair to say, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna ignore our management and our senior staff. Next question. Next question. Uh, 
Easy one. Have you edited any of our projects? And if so, what have you edited? I'm not an editor, I'm going to admit. And I'm actually a casualty of the female ratio, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I'm going to tr try to remedy that and lead by example. Um, but I tried editing, uh, I think, a first time maybe seven years ago now, and it got reverted almost immediately. I fixed something uh, small. Um, and I actually tried looking uh, at it again um, just a few days ago. Um, and I was... I was surprised that the syntax hasn't changed a lot. <laughs> well, but uh, but I, I, one thing that I have to say, uh, I think it's really important in order to understand your users. It's really important to become to be one, right? So that um, I have the same experience as our users have. So it, while I might not become the, you know, one of those. 10,000 edits per people, I probably will not be that. Um, I will make sure that I understand what the experience for somebody who edits Wikipedia um, looks like and what the pain points are. And there's a question back. S? Hi, um, I'm S. Page. I'm an engineer on the Flow team. Um, uh, I was trying to figure out whether Sugar CRM has a sort of hosted version. And related to that, um, do you have what's your experience with running a really large website? You know, that, with, that serves billions of users. Thank you. So Sugar CRM does have a um, hosted version. In fact, I was brought into Sugar to build the first uh, hosted uh, version of um, uh, of the environment. And uh, what we did is we built it with commodity boxes, completely 100% open source, um, and we scaled it since then, and it's in hundreds of millions, not in billions. Uh, before that, I've, I was part of a small organization that was supporting really large companies so uh, for uh, telecommunication industry. And our requirements around hosting have been in uh, uh, seven nines um, SLAs. And we had uh, spikes in the billions uh, of transactions uh, overnight. Uh, before that, I did this for Bank of America, uh, where we had to process um, uh, hundreds of millions to billions of stock transactions uh, to make sure that there was no like, inside trading, things like that. Um, so I have uh, my my background is truly in uh, DevOps and uh, and product design. All right, um, one question for James, and then Fabrice, and then we need to start closing this out. James, go ahead. Uh, actually, Fabrice has a mic, so Fabrice, go ahead. Um, I have a question about our largest user group, readers. Um, we um, often are not able to involve the readers as much as we'd like in decisions that concern them. Uh, and often we tend to listen more to the vocal minority that is active on our talk pages, but the readers are not comfortable participating on those pages. And, Often we don't really know what they think, and yet they're a primary beneficiary of the service that we operate. Uh, what are your thoughts about reaching out more to readers and other user groups that may not be represented in our decision-making system at this time? Thank you, Fabrice. It's a fantastic question. Um, I actually really think that understanding our end users, the reader group, is uh, is just as important, um, and we need to be um, to be understanding them better. Uh, there are different engagement models that we can deploy there. We can deploy them directly through the site, but we can also uh, orchestrate and uh, tool the site itself to understand what their uh, what the problems are and their bottlenecks are. So we can look at it both quantitatively and quant uh, qualitatively. So at Sugar, for example, we've done both. Um, I brought in a researcher that specifically did two things. We would go out on location and uh, we would just observe how people use the website. Okay, so just this is qualitative. We just see what people, what problems people run into. Um, it's really high touch, uh, and it's in different locations in the world. So, for example, last time we went to Brazil and we went to uh, Germany uh, to observe that. Another thing that we've done is we uh, uh, instrumented the site uh, in high detail um, with ma understanding the metrics, right? Where do people drop off? How long do they spend on every particular page? 
how long each individual action takes them. And then we compared from one revision to another, we compared if we were improving, and we set goals so that with each, with each one of them, we had to make improvements to uh, user experience. Because it's, uh, at the foundation, user experience is really how quickly and how well can I get from to the point that I want to get. We're going to do one last question from James. We might get a Kaldari question in. FYI, because <laughs> FYI, this is a celebration, so Lynette's going to be starting to pass out mimosas because we're going to do a toast <laughs> after the Q&A ends before moving on to the rest of the metrics meeting. Oh. Exactly. So, James, please ask your questions, and for and then for those of you um, in the back, um, mimosas will be moving. On behalf of the remote non mimosa constituency, uh, <laughs> what are your experiences with remote employees, and in particular, what are your thoughts on mixing a primary single post in San Francisco with a widespread geographic uh, staff audience? That's a great question. So, uh, in true spirit of open source, um, I. I'm one of the big fans of having a distributed uh, workforce uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one is people uh, from different regions understand better how those particular regions work. Um, they bring in color, more color and more expertise with respect to a diverse um, uh, user base as well, just like the one that we have. So, um, for example, at Sugar, we had people in Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe, all over the United States and Canada. Uh, we had people in India. We had people in uh, um, in South America, all over the place. Um, and I thought that that was, uh, it was a fantastic experience. Now, to the portion that there is an anchor post in San Francisco that uh, presents benefits but also presents challenges and we will definitely have to think about them uh, as we grow the organization to make sure that people who are not in San Francisco don't easily get uh, feel left out of the conversations that we're having. Thank you. One, Kaldari, go ahead since we are still yeah. passing up my uh, I'm Ryan Kaldari. I'm a software engineer. Uh, I was just going to ask if uh, increasing the diversity of our editor, of our user base, is a priority for you, and if so, did you have any thoughts on addressing that? Um, I think that uh, increasing diversity period is, is very important, just because um, there are different, well, first of all, uh, our mission is all about bringing knowledge to everyone. Um, and if so, some group of people is cut out of that, as that's not everyone, right? Um, there are different uh, possibilities around how to attack the problem. But again, at the heart of it is how we think uh, uh, having empathy with the people and their motivations in that particular group. So when I think about what motivates women, for example, is not going to be the same thing that motivates man at large. So, what motivates somebody in South Africa is going to be different from what motivates somebody in Australia. So again, I think thinking about what those people care about and what's important for them and what their life is like on an everyday basis is going to be really important. I'm looking forward to uh, learning and experimenting with that. I have some thoughts, but I think it's too early to uh, throw them out here yet. Thank you. Thank you. Does everybody have a drink? Who wants one? Yourself. Pass one up to Fabrice. So the first toast is uh, to Lila. Thank you for being here. We are so excited to have you. And to new beginnings and to great leadership for us. Thank you for having me. And there is one additional toast um, to Sue Gardner for her leadership in getting us to this point and making the most happen. And to all of us, because we're awesome. So. <laughs> I've been really excited about this. I think this is a great start for us. Um, Lila will be hanging around to answer more questions and will be available for the staff lunch. And um, we are going to pick up with our metrics meeting, but the first thing we want to do is 
set a couple expectations just so you know what to expect in terms of the next month. I'm going to toss the mic back to Sue um, for that piece, just to um, frame up sure. what the next month might look like. Sure. Is this on? Yes. yes. Um, so I think I said some of this um, in, <clears throat> in my note this morning. And uh, much has to be determined still. So actually, some of the things I'm going to say, I'm going to look at you while I'm saying them, and I'm going to see if you're nodding. <laughs> um, what, what we intend to do is I, I, I want handover to be crisp, right? And I want handover to be crisp because I worry that if it is not crisp, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I worry that if it is not Chris, people will spend a bunch of time just tripping over each other trying to figure out, like, do I talk to Sue or do I talk to Lila? How does it work? Blah, 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 blah. I want us to avoid that because that's just noise and confusion. It doesn't get us anywhere. So um, what's going to happen in the month of May is this. Um, in, in, immediately, Lila will begin uh, going to the quarterly reviews. I don't think we have anything scheduled for this week or next week, but she will be going to the quarterly reviews for the remainder of May and going forward from that. Um, Lila, I'm expecting, will be in the office, with the exception of the hackathon and maybe a couple days holiday or whatever, will be in the office most of the time, most days for most of the day, um, having meetings with people, getting briefed by the C-level people and by their teams, attending the quarterly reviews. She and I have already had a off-site deep dive part of which was on her deck in Los Gatos, which I highly recommend. <laughs> um, and she has a very nice dog and kitten. <laughs> um, but uh, we had one deep dive. We're going to have another deep dive later in May, um, where we kind of go off site for a couple days and just kind of mind meld on stuff. Um, and I think you're going to be doing lots of casual walking around, meeting with people, sitting down, going for coffee, all of that kind of thing. Um, in the meantime, I will have signing authority uh, until June 1. That means all the normal travel approvals, contract approvals, um, final hiring interviews, all of those things will be with me as they have been um, until June 1. And I will continue to stick candle uh, the development of the annual plan. So the annual plan, which is like in deep, grindy, 10 hours a day development right now, um, gets shipped to the board on the 30th of May. And so shipping the annual plan will probably be my final act as ED. I'm going to loop you in. I don't know exactly how that's going to work. I don't expect you to get your head around all the nuts and bolts of stuff, but obviously we'll be talking and consulting. And I'm expecting that through May, um, I'm going to offer Lila to commandeer this room behind me and just use it to camp in and leave your stuff in and have meetings in and all of that. I think that's the simplest thing. Um, was there other stuff, Gail, that I am supposed to say that I'm forgetting? I think that covers it. Yeah. OK, so that's how it's going to yeah. work for the next month. And then as of June 1, it's all really clean and crisp and straightforward. So it is not um, just Lila as the new executive team member's first uh, metrics meeting, but it is also the first metrics meeting for another member of our executive team who is new, and that is Catherine. So I'd love to invite Catherine up here. Is that on? I just want to thank you, Catherine, so much for all the help she's given me already, but us, organization as a whole, in the last few weeks because there's been, there's been so much work running up to this. <laughs> um, as you can imagine, um, I am thrilled to have these positions filled. I'm thrilled to have Catherine on board. I wanted to give her a moment to introduce herself as well. She started April 14th and total deep dive. This is um, quite a big thing that she's taken on. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you. So um, let me get you a mic. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, it's a little bit of out of the frying pan and into the fire these last couple of weeks. Um, I can't imagine a more exciting time to be joining, though. Uh, I arrived on my first day, and everyone was like, so we've got a project for you. Uh, it's a transition. Try to get to know your team, but we're going to you know, run off to meetings all the time and, and write a bunch of documents, which has been great. I can't imagine a better way to get to know the foundation through actually having to start to speak in the language of the foundation, through going through this process of getting to know Sue so well, the executive team so well, and of course, getting to know Lila as she's come on board. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I just moved out here from DC, so I'm still getting to know San Francisco. I'm really excited if you guys have recommendations, thoughts, by all means, please stop on by. I, it's a new city for me. It's a new job for me. 
my cubicle is always open. Um, I'm really <laughs> excited to hear about you know what your expectations are for the communications team, but also just to get to know you all a little bit more personally. Like Lila, I'm not an editor. Um, I've already reached out to a few of you to help me learn how to be one, though. And so again, all unsolicited advice is very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm always excited to have more women on the team. This is fantastic. Eric, let's have a metrics meeting. So in addition to um, Lila and Catherine, we've got a few more folks. We do. Where is Sarah La Rodland? Sarah Way? Sarah Rodland. <laughs> Joining the administrative support team for engineering. Yep. And Danny Horn. That's Danny, Danny Horn. Horn. Welcome. Danny is starting to uh, take over product management for the Flow project, and Mariana is transitioning over to the mobile team um, that she PM before. And Dimitri is remote in Ohio, and I think he's on IC. Hi, Dimitri. Um, Hi, Dimitri. <laughs> Joining the mobile apps team on the Android side. And it's Edward in the office. Woohoo, yes. Hey, Edward. With program evaluation. And where's four? Welcome. So we also have Max Semenik, San Francisco, and Patrick Early. All right. And Dustin York with grants. Where, Great. Dustin, where are you? Not here. Not here at the moment. So wander around, say hi to these folks, welcome them to the foundation, and we are going to move into our high-level metrics. With so, Eric. yeah, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the top-line metrics. Uh, you can look at them as always, but I have asked Toby and Oliver um, to prepare an update uh, specifically on mobile traffic data. Um, we haven't looked at the mobile data in detail in a while, and particularly I wanted us to have a better shared understanding of app versus web usage, tablet versus phone usage, and some of the basic metrics around mobile for our sites. So um, Toby and Oliver, um, uh, Oliver um, has done some analysis based on our sample lock data, um, and we'll also have some new analysis based on Hadoop soon. But this is an early preview of some of the new mobile metrics. So where are they? Oh, there you are. Coming up. <laughs> So uh, this is going to run a little bit over, but timekeeping is up here. So uh, we're following the announcement of the new ED. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, welcome. I'm Toby. Um, I'm on the analytics team. Come on up. I'll put down the mimosa. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, like Eric said, we're really starting. You know, we have a lot of information about our editors. We know a lot about our desktop users. We don't know a lot about our mobile users. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to try to keep it pretty tight. Um, I'm just going to offer a little bit of context, a little information about the global mobile market, and um, then I'm going to turn it over to Oliver, who's really done uh, the data uh, work on this project. Okay, so um, first thing I'm going to talk about is the number of devices that have been sold um, in the world over the last two years. And this is the number of smartphones. Um, number of feature phones is about double this. Um, it's really an Android world. Uh, you know, the, the, the vast number of smartphones sold have been, have been Android, and the, and the number's rising, going from about 69% to 79% of the market. And I just want you to go, if there's one thing to take away from this slide, it's the number of devices that are sold. Like a billion smartphones were sold last year, and that is a really big number. So when we think about uh, the impact of this technology on our readers and our editors, it's, it's going to be pretty profound. Uh, but look, it's an iOS world, because still the majority of browsing um, actually comes from iOS devices. This is dropping. I think we can expect it to, to see this drop and equalize. Uh, fairly quickly. Finally, it's an app. Star Wars, get it? Um, this, yeah, yeah, that didn't work. It was Oliver's idea. So, uh, that's actually true. I think. 
anyway, so so this is it's this is a little apples to oranges. This is the U.S. It's not from um, sort of a, a it's from a, a mobile advertising company, but I thought it was interesting. So in the U.S., the majority of time spent on the mobile internet is app based, um, and I think when we when we see Oliver's work, um, this is going to be a, a real difference between our readers and uh, sort of the, the the U.S. internet. So uh, questions. All right, I'll turn it over. Oh, sorry. Uh, more app. Uh, I think it's gone from, I think, 80 to 90. Yeah, I think it's like 86% over the last two years. And I think this is a snapshot of March traffic. But this so. is for the rest of the, the world. Uh, so, yeah. Oh. Uh, say again? Um, just to make it clear, this is the industry-wide data as opposed to the Wikimedia data. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's US, US only. So uh, I'll turn it over to Oliver. Thank you. Um, is this thing on? Yes, it is. In line with uh, the wonderful example my dear leader has uh, provided about uh, bot passing, um, anything you like in this presentation was, what was my work. Anything you don't like, he helped with. Um, so before I start, I'd actually like to uh, thank uh, two people. Those are uh, Christian and Eric Zakte. Um, they both provided uh, a lot of help and invaluable support and advice and review with this, which is good because, well, one of them has been studying page views since before I was working for analytics, and the other has been studying page views since before I graduated from high school. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do this without them. So here's what we've got. Uh, we start off with the uh, request logs, the logs of every request for an asset or a page or anything to our sites. Um, these are a, 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 they're only a piece of the continent or a part of the main. They are sampled at a 1 to 1,000 ratio. Um, this is one of the reasons you'll see we're putting everything in percentage terms. Um, we filter it down to what are actual page views, uh, which is text or HTML, uh, text HTML requests and um, requests from APIs, uh, requests to the API that match one of the apps we're tracking. Um, we then pass the user agents, which are the little fingerprints of, hey, this is me, that you provide each request. Uh, we then prayed heavily. I, just because I don't think it's going to work doesn't mean it's not useful. It's just improbable. Um, and then we get results and share them with expecting looking people here. So there are some caveats. These are things that might be wrong. Uh, the filtering might be wrong first. Like, we may be excluding things we should be including or including things we should be excluding. Uh, the user agent parser might be wrong. Maybe half of the iOS devices we're seeing are actually Android. Um, it's unlikely, but, you know. Uh, and finally, I'm happy to say that we've conclusively proven uh, Method Man's hypothesis. Cache indeed rules everything around us. Um, there is a lot of caching, we know, at the user end, at the ISP end, so any absolute values are probably going to underrepresent. Uh, what's really going on. So, without further ado, page views. Uh, one brief explanation of sort of the, the display method here. Um, what we did was we took the page view percentages for each day and then for each month averaged the daily values. That's why it's mean daily page views but measured in months. Um, so what we can see is that desktop is fairly consistently maybe trending a bit down around 75% of our page views. Uh, mobile and apps make up the remaining 25%, heavily, heavily, heavily biased towards uh, the mobile web. Apps is responsible for about 1.5 to 2% of our traffic. Um, I don't really have any thoughts here, except that I think it's interesting that we have such a difference from, I guess, the US population in terms of you know people using the mobile web rather than using apps. Um, if I had to throw out a hypothesis, it would simply be that uh, it's a difference of business practices. Companies tend to like having walled gardens where they control the content and where they can make people look at their stuff. And so you go to any mobile website for LinkedIn or Facebook or whoever, and they're like, hey, please download our app. We don't do that because we're not terrible and banners are for fundraising and when we're broke. Uh, in terms of the destination, so if we take mobile phones and uh, tablets and look at the site they go to, um, almost all of the phones end up at the mobile website, which is unsurprising because we redirect them there by default. Around 7% of the tablet devices end up there, which is slightly more surprising insofar as they're directed to the desktop site by default, although this is changing soon. Um, Tablets are responsible for about 25% of the page views, mobile around 75% of the page views to the mobile website. Um, I find this a bit high, but frankly, that's anecdata based simply on I don't know that many people with 
you know, tablets. Uh, are you defining tablet as a device or a screen size? Excellent question. Um, the user agent parser we're using does not have such a thing as a device class. And so what I had to do is go through a list of all the devices that were being identified all 23,000 of them, and hand code them to work out which were tablets and which were phones. It's got to the point where I can recognize a Samsung tablet from its serial number. This is, no, this is not a skill it's good to have. <laughs> no, based on the user agent. Yep. Yeah. So before you code back the numbers that you're seeing here, be aware that this is a percentage of the device's traffic. Um, yeah. So um, tablets make up a quarter of the mobile traffic. They don't make up a quarter of all traffic. Yes. Um, in terms of operating systems, for phones, uh, iOS makes up about 75% of the operating systems from the requests that we see. Um, Android, 25%, and the remainder is split between, well, other. It's Windows devices or BlackBerry. There are still people using Blackberries. I was as shocked as you are. Um, this is kind of in line with the global stuff that Toby showed earlier. I think the divide is slightly greater, um, but nothing spectacular. For tablets, on the other hand, um, Android only makes up about 15%. Uh, iOS gobbles up the rest. Um, the global data, unfortunately, is not broken down into you know phones and tablets, so it's hard to say this is completely out of line. Um, it might be, it might not be, um, but this is the status. Uh, iOS is just eating the tablet market. Um, with the requests for apps, on the other hand, we see it the other way around. Android is actually winning, not by much, and it's only about 7 to 10%, but they are winning. Um, I don't have an explanation here. I just think it's an interesting data point. Uh, the mobile apps team can probably use it better than I can. Uh, so things we're doing next. Uh, first, we're going to be switching over to Hadoop. Um, I said at the beginning, you know, this is a 1 to 1,000 sampled uh, log. Uh, we're going to be switching over to a system which produce it, which contains all of the data, which means that we can hopefully be more accurate and also produce absolute counts. Um, we're then going to work on a uh, better definition of page views, something more philosophically in line with what we're actually looking to count, rather than just you know all the requests. Um, and we're then going to work on uh, handing it over to the analytics engineers so they can build a team, uh, build a, a system that can handle this consistently, so that we can just have rolling updates instead of one-off reports. Um, and finally, in my remaining six seconds, uh, this is the page views trend by day. Every single Friday, desktop drops, and every Saturday morning, uh, mobile picks up the slack. This amused the hell out of me. Questions? Rotten fruit. So real, real quick, I just want to um, add that uh, as part of the page view definition and as part of what we're doing in analytics, we're going to involve the community and particularly with an eye to uh, respecting the desire for privacy on some uh, on the part of, of some members of the community. So that's that's really important to us. I know I, I know I always say this, but we're very serious about this. Yeah, sorry. I was meant to mention that and then I ran out of time. Uh, yeah, like we wouldn't be able to come up with a decent definition without involving, well, everyone who has any interest in paid views. That's, you know, ops and that's fundraising and that's also the community and its readers and its makers of third-party apps and yada, yada, yada. Uh, hi, Oliver. My question was going back to the one of the tablet slides. I think you only showed um, uh, iOS and Android, and I was kind of surprised that there there were like no other tablets, no Windows, no anything. Is that is that a mismeasurement, or is that the actual fact? Uh, so the limitation was I mentioned there were you know twenty two thousand devices. Um, I prioritized hand coding them by how many requests were associated with each unique device. So there are Windows devices. Um, Undoubtedly, uh, but either they're sort of grouped into the you know other category um, because they're not Android or iOS, uh, or they're just you know used so rarely that we didn't hand code them. Like for something to not get hand coded, it had to produce fewer than ten thousand requests in thirty days. One more question. Or no more questions. Oh. Moving on. Oh, Jen, my <laughs> Um, so this is uh, this is fantastic information. How are you? Uh, what are the outcomes of this? How do you use it? Uh, what becomes of it? You know, how does it how, do, how does it feed into the next? What are the next steps? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
this is, I guess, twofold. First, it was useful because you know it gives us a, a static update on a snapshot of, of this is what mobile looks like at the moment. Um, it's more useful, though, as a um, opportunity to prototype the system. Um, you know, from the this data, we might not be able to extract that much. But what we can do is use it to prototype. You know, how do we identify apps, or how do we identify mobile devices, or how do we filter, and what is a paid view, and how do we filter API requests, and so on and so forth, which will hopefully contribute to um, building a, a more consistent and thorough system using the uh, absolute page view numbers, um, which we can then expand to answer like specific research requests or do ad hoc analysis. Thanks, Oliver. Maybe I can add a little color to that. I think, uh, yes, we are definitely using it to build out our expertise, but we are also planning on sharing it with the mobile team. Um, Oliver is the mobile analyst and working with that team to uh, come up with some insights, actual insights on the data, because that's the point, right, is to figure out what our users are doing and um, to provide them with a better experience. So this is step one, working with Thomas and our other stakeholders. It's definitely step 1.1. <laughs> For me, the, the big question going forward is going to be um, when it comes to our apps, right now our offerings, are the ones that are available in, in the uh, Google Play Store and iTunes are not that great. Um, they are the uh, existing PhoneGap apps. Um, the Android one is okay. The iOS one is not that great. Um, and we're rebooting them. So we're relaunching the, the apps as native apps uh, in about a month. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see if we improve the quality of the app experience. Are we seeing a significant change in those trends? Are we seeing users organically start using the apps more? Are we going to see higher engagement from existing app users? And what does that mean for our sort of resourcing and investment in apps going forward? We don't plan currently to put a ton of effort towards apps, but we are growing both the Android and the iOS team so we can at least offer a very rich and um, performant experience on both platforms. And having this data is essential in order for us to understand if our strategy is actually working. And another thing to keep in mind is that we're talking about page views here and reach of users, which is incredibly important. But one of the things that we're going to have out of the gate with the rebooted apps is editing. And we really want to see what user engagement is like from that standpoint. As we've built native apps for photo contributions, we've seen users come back frequently and contribute really high quality content. And we think that we'll be able to get the same from the native applications for editing as well. So it's important to think about both readership and also contributions to really complete the holistic um, loop in the Wikimedia community. Call an end to that piece. Eric, do we want to do the wiki data update? Awesome. So do we have Lydia on the Hangout? Thank you, guys. Okay. Hi, Lydia. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Let me share my screen. This is Lydia Pincher from Wikimedia Germany. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome, uh, Lila. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the hackathon in uh, Zurich uh, next week. Now let's get to some uh, Wikidata things. We've been doing a lot uh, since I last gave an update uh, at the metrics meeting about six months ago, I believe. Um, one of the main things we've been concentrating on is in bug fixing and improving page load times. So what you see here is page load time, um, and we've cut it down to about one-tenth, um, which makes editing Wikidata a lot more fun now. <clears throat> Another thing we've been doing is uh, edit, uh, improving diffs for, for edits. So, for example, in this um, diff, someone edited an uh, image to the item for Sherlock, and you can now easily click uh, the link to the image to check that it's actually an image of that person. So we hope this uh, will help improve the quality of the content on Wikidata. <clears throat> Another thing we introduced is ranks. Um, as you can see, this is an item about an association that has a chairperson. And one of them uh, is the current chairperson, the one at the top, and the other one at the bottom is a past chairperson. And we've introduced ranks to 
be able to distinguish those. So the first one um, here has a preferred rank and the other one a normal so that it's easily machine readable which one is um, preferred and current. <clears throat> Another thing we've enabled is the uh, number uh, quantities data type so that you can enter things like um, the number of inhabitants of a, of a city. Unfortunately, we don't have units yet, so it's still limited, but we hope to fix that um, within this year. We have also enabled more sister projects. So the first one uh, was Wikisource, and the second one, Wikicode. Um, we hope to move on to Wikinews uh, next. I don't have a date for that yet, but I will um, publish that as soon as, soon as I have it. <clears throat> Another thing um, one of our community members has done is uh, the linking of other sister projects in the sidebar. So what you see here is French wiki source. And in the sidebar, they have links to Wikipedia, Wikiquote, comments, and Wikidata based on the data that is in Wikidata. So this is not saved in the uh, wiki text of the article anymore. If you want this for your wiki, uh, please find local consensus and open a bug. I would be very happy to enable that for more wikis. And uh, now let's go on to some demos. Um, the first thing is something a team of students has been working on for us. That is... Um, <clears throat> an entity suggester. So you're here on the item about Potsdam, which is a city nearby. And it has a lot of information, like the postal code, um, is the administrative unit it is in, the country it is in, and the um, German municipality key, um, which identifies the city. Now, obviously, a lot of on this item is still missing. And what the students have been doing is work on a suggester that uh, suggests you information that you should probably add to this item based on the other information that is already there. So for example, this is a city, so it should have a coordinate location that so we can identify where the city actually is. This is not live yet on Wikidata, but um, will hopefully go live in the next weeks. And I, my hope is that this will help um, entering information in Wikidata a lot because it makes it so much more obvious what kind of information is missing on, on certain pages. <clears throat> Another thing we've uh, been working on and that people have been looking forward to is uh, simple query functionality. It is still rough, but I can give you the very first demo here now. Um, so on this demo system, for example, I wanted to show me all continents that are there. Um, so I can look for instance of a continent. And it will show me all seven of them. This still needs code review and so on. Um, but this should go live in the next month. Uh, and hopefully help um, keep the data on Wikidata um, in a good shape. And also make it easier to find uh, information on Wikidata, obviously. And uh, the last example I have is something that was done as a 20% project at Google. Uh, this is called QLabel, and it's a library that lets you use Wikidata translations anywhere on the web. So for example, here you see a map, and um, I can switch the language using ULS uh, to, for example, um, English. And it will show me the map in English. And I can use basically any language that is available on Wikidata, Portuguese, for example, now. I can do the same with the restaurant menu, for example. Um, <clears throat> it's a menu in English. I can easily have it translated to German. 
Again, this can be used on any website out there on the web using Wikidata data. I'm really excited uh, about seeing that adopted more because it's, it has a lot of potential uh, for things like this. If you have more questions, um, you can reach me on IRC. I will be there in two minutes. Or you are welcome to send me an email, come to our IRC channel. Um, and of course, I can answer questions now if you have any. Any questions out there? Thank you, it looks Lydia. Like it's quiet in the room today. All right. Thanks for the update. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. And we will be. doing a super quick update on Wikipedia Zero, and then we'll be wrapping up. Um, these are just some high-level numbers of the recent launches. Carolyn, yes. take it away. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Carolyn. And I'm here with an update from the you Wikipedia can use this. Zero team. Uh, since, okay. since our last update in February, we launched four partners. Three of them are on Wikipedia Zero. That's MTN in South Africa, Safaricom in Kenya, and IPCO in Kosovo just announced a couple of days ago. We also are running a free promotion with SMART in the Philippines. What's cool about that one is that um, we were able to connect the Wikimedia Philippine community with SMART, and SMART is now sponsoring the heritage mapping project that's going on right now in the Philippines. So this is our map. We're in 26 countries with 28 partners. Um, that includes the short-term promotion in the Philippines. We're hoping to convert them to long-term. Um, I did a kind of a makeshift heat map so you could see where the page views are coming from. And they're coming from the places where the people are for the most part. But we added South Africa and the Philippines since you last saw it and Kosovo over there. So we um, have hit 68 million page views, free page views in April. So we'll keep growing. <laughs> the growth is coming from new launches. Also, Grameen Phone in Bangladesh has been running a really great promotion on the Bangla Wikipedia. So that's been working really well. So 68 is an approximation. If you were to look at the limb chart that's publicly available, it would look like we were at almost 100 million page views. And I just am pointing this out in case anybody looks and wonders about that. There's a bunch of invalid page views that are coming from keeprefreshing.com. So they're not real. Um, and so thank you, engineering is working on that. And analytics, heads up, we're going to have a, we have a little skew in the data. Um, so I just wanted to mention that these are, uh, this chart is available, of course, on, um, well, Dummy Meth Labs, but it's connected on MetaWiki. Okay, so that's my update. Any questions? Nope. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank and you. It's time for lunch. All right. So we've we've, we've staffed lunch. Um, it's backed by illegal, so that we can keep the noise down during the first part of the metrics. So go back there, help yourself to tacos and fajitas and whatnot. And there are cupcakes once the string gets raised. I know you're expecting something else behind the screen, but there's just cupcakes back there. I know, so sad. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. No, there's no, 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 no blow-up pictures of anyone yet. Yeah.